Hello students, welcome to the analyst dated 9th of September 2023. Today we'll look at five important articles from the Indian Express and the Hindu. The first article will be regarding the key agenda at discussion when it pertains to your G20. And here we may come out with the New Delhi Declaration. Then we'll take up South China Sea. Then we'll discuss Belt and Road or One Belt, One Road. Then we'll look at the African Union. And finally, we'll look at incremental cash reserve ratio. Now, the first article pertains to your GS2. And we all know today the G20 deliberations are in place in the Bharat Mandapam. That is the new Pragati Medan in Delhi. And India is the president of G20 this year. Now, let's look at what are the commons and the contentions that are going through these deliberations. So, <clears throat> On the 9th of September, there will be two sessions. And on the 10th of September, there will be a single session. And out of this single session will come out the New Delhi Declaration. If there is a consensus. If there is no consensus, then there will be a statement. Statement made by the head of state who is the president. That is our Prime Minister. Now, this, these three sessions are backed by more than 100 meetings spanning 60 cities with the theme of Vasudev Kutumbakam. One earth, one family, one future. Whenever we say one earth, we are essentially galvanizing green initiatives. Whenever we say one family, we are essentially promoting inclusive growth. And when we say inclusive, it does not mean inclusive growth only for India or for Indians, but for the world. That means the inclusion of Global South, the inclusion of developing countries in this growth story. Then to synergize technology for one future. So technology should not create divides, it should bridge divides. So those are the themes on which India is working. Now, these 100 plus meetings, they were taken up by Sherpas or the representatives of the different countries. Then once the Sherpas have concluded their meetings, so they would submit it to the head of states. And these head of states, they have culminated from all across the world into India or Delhi today to finally declare, to finally come out with some consensus. Now, what are the key elements where we are differing and what are the commons that we are looking at? So, the finance track of G20 was looking at reform in multilateral development banks like IMF. Now, why this is so important? So, we looked at a pandemic. We looked at COVID-19. And COVID-19 required some recovery. And this recovery can only be done through money. Now, this money also created some divide. Why? Because the bigger institutions, the bigger countries, they usually get access to finance, but the smaller countries couldn't tap into finance. Simultaneously, what we are looking at is that there is wrongful representation. When we compare, let's say, the voting share, voting share of, let's say, LDCs, Africa, developing countries, emerging economies. So what do we see? That there is a mismatch between voting share and the economics, the potential economic size or the population. Right? And if there is mismatch, then what happens? Then these multilateral development banks, they still remain West dominated. West domination is there. And therefore, they are not able to grapple with 21st century challenges. Why? Because the voting structure and their own structure is West centric. And this has also given a lot of space to countries like China to come up with alternatives. Alternatives, let's say, Beijing led banks under the SCU. Right? So, an alternate model, a regional model, and Challenges to these multilateral banks have been created. Why? Because they are not 
commensurate to the emerging economic designs of 21st century and the emerging challenges. Now, what are the areas of consensus that we are trying to reach? So, the idea is to focus on non-geopolitical issue. Why? Because the moment there is geopolitics, we see what? We see that China has sided a lot with Russia. On the other hand, we see that the G7 or can we say the West, they have drawn very hard lines when it comes to Russia-Ukraine issue. So the G7 wants the mention of Russia-Ukraine issue and the condemnation of the actions of Russia. On the other hand, countries like India, they want to work on humanitarian aid. And for China and Russia, Russia-Ukraine issue should not even be touched upon if it is against their national interest. So, this creates a lot of contention. And therefore, the idea for India as the president is to focus on non-geopolitical issues. Let's say climate transition. So, going from, let's say, fossil fuel based economy towards a clean energy based economy or going for a healthy green energy mix. Right? Then the issue of climate finance. So, one thing is appreciable that we have to move from coal to green energy and different forms, a, a healthy mix of green energy. But who will fund this? And so, who will fund this? And what will be the proportion of funding? Will India contribute equally to US or will they contribute in accordance with their population or in accordance with their economic size? And should a country like Morocco or a country like Gabon or any African country, any African LDC country, should they also contribute? Or the contribution should come from the West and the developed economies? and are we involved in double counting? Double counting. How? Let's say some private sector, the uh, private sector company of, let's say, US, they are investing in some other country. Can we count it also? Or will it be purely government based funding? Then the issue of greenwashing. Calling a particular project as green, yet inherently in its structure, it is non-green. So just using the name green to get money and to use the money and to sanction projects. So then we have to look at phasing out fossil fuels. Now this is a contentious issue for any country, let's say like Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia does not look at immediate phasing out of fossil fuels. It predicts that at least by 20, at least till 2050, the demand of fuel will increase. On the other hand, what do we see the West saying? So the West are targeting 2045, 2049, 2050 as their net zero years, right? Different countries, different targets. India, on the other hand, 2070. So respectable conditions and thereby respectable targets. So different phase of development if a country is, so they will have different targets. Then the idea of debt restructuring, why? Because we had COVID. So a lot of companies, they want, they wanted funds. A lot of companies went bankrupt. And for recovery, a lot of loans were given. And a lot of loan waivers were also given. Let's say interest rate waivers. So now, if let's say some country, some LDC country has taken some loans and they're not able to repay. So can we go for debt restructuring from these large institutions? Then India seeks to become the voice of global south. And more particularly, the global south is less of, is less about geography and is more about economics. Why? Because whenever we, we say global south, we are essentially meaning 
that the non-West countries or the countries which are not part of the Western ecosystem of development. So why the voice of Global South? Because India sees itself and relates itself to the Global South and there are divides between the Global North and the Global South. And these divides are in form of, let's say, finance, in technology, in state of the art, let's say technology, then in form of know-how, in terms of supply chain, in form of business maturity. So these have and have nots between the world, they are unhealthy if we want to fight the global commons. Then the idea of digital public infrastructure and India has been pitching this for G20. Why? Because the government is to do what? Is for the betterment of the people. So we the people. So if the government can leverage this digital public infrastructure and reach the people directly and very good examples is the UPI, the DBT, the Jam Trinity and upcoming ONDC. So multiple models, multiple success stories, let's say the rupee card. So all these success stories, whether we are talking about QR codes, so what are these? Are they not enabling our people to have more voice and choice in the democracy? So leveraging digital public infrastructure for the global good, for the growth of all. And that is the idea of inclusive growth. And that is the idea of where technology is used for betterment, for inclusion of all, all the world, all the citizens of the world and thereby achieving the ideals of Vasudev Kutumbaka. Then India was also looking at cryptocurrency. So <clears throat> let's rewind a little. So first the government was, the government of India did not like the ideas of cryptocurrency. Then RBI as the regulator also didn't like the idea. So eventually what was there? A ban. Then this ban was lifted due to Supreme Court judgment. So Supreme Court said no, it's unfair. But now what India is doing? Because we are suffering from global issues like terrorism, like money laundering. So we want to regulate cryptocurrency. And this regulation, for this regulation, it asked the IMF and the Financial Stability Board to come out with a framework. So a global framework on cryptocurrency so that the crypto asset platform, they can be licensed. So bringing cryptocurrency and the entire cryptocurrency economy under the ambit or regulation of the government. So, so moving its stance from an all, all right, from a complete ban towards extensive regulation. So that is also that we see a policy maturity coming in this direction. Why? Because it serves as a macroeconomic risk for the entire Indian economy as well as for the global financial stability. Given that we have already taken a lot of shocks in last three years. Now let's look at the concerns. So Russia-Ukraine issue remains a sticky point and what will be the statement on Russia-Ukraine is the most debatable issue. Why? Because countries like let's say UK under Prime Minister Sunak, then US under President Biden, they are sticking to it that they want some reference of Russia-Ukraine issue. Every country, majority of the country wants India to condemn the actions of Russia and India wants to keep a neutral stance and because of this neutral stance that India has kept, it has been possible to talk and to have discussion with both the sides of the aisle, that is the West and the Russia, China. And what, what have we seen? We have seen that recently the East Asia summit have been concluded, has been concluded in Jakarta, Indonesia, and there was no consensus at all. Then India is also looking to go for bilaterals along these sidelines. So whenever we are talking about the general electric deal with HAL, for jet engines or we are talking about general atomics whenever we are looking at let's say procurement of HAL drones or we are looking at creating these nuclear reactors with Westinghouse 
and NPCIL. So these takeaways will also be in the bilaterals along the sidelines. Now, the, the uh, declaration, the Delhi declaration will only be possible if there is no veto. Why? Because G20 follows a consensus based approach. So, all countries have a veto over joint declaration. And if there is no joint declaration, and which has never been done in the history of G20, so they have always come out with a declaration. And India would like to push its agenda, so non geopolitical agenda, in this declaration and to bring the West and the Russia China axis on a common ground. Now, one thing is important that she, President Xi and President Putin, they have given a miss to G20 in India, even though Russia maintains a very healthy relationship with India. Now, <clears throat> there were also issues about the China-India issue, whether it pertains to your LAC, in particular, the Chumbi Valley, your Galwan, your Doklam. So, talking about the resolution of border issues, so what India has said is that these are bilateral issues and they have no significance in the G20 talks, right? So now we look at what happens after 10th of September or on 10th of September, what is the key outcomes that we derive from the G20 meeting that we are, that is taking place in Delhi. Let's look at the next article. So Philippines condemns illegal actions by Chinese boats in South China Sea. This again pertains to your GS2. And this is a news of extreme importance. Now, what is the location? So, location is western edge of your Pacific Ocean. Or you can also say the south of China. Or southeast of China and south of East Asia. Now, why this region is extremely important? Because we see that these, these countries are majorly ASEAN countries. So, you have your Southeast Asia. Then here, you have East Asia. So, the region where Southeast Asia and East Asia meet, that is your South China Sea and it has become a bone of contention for all the all the countries in this region. Why? Because of the Chinese unilateralism. So <clears throat> it is extremely vital for maritime routes. Why? Because of trade and freedom of navigation in accordance with the international laws of UNCLOS. Now, why it has become a territorial dispute? Because of the 9 or you can say 10 dash line. So what would China do is it will look into some of its text, some ancient text, then it will claim historical territory. Then it will draw a new map and after this declaration of the new map, it will deploy some defense equipments in these islands. And this region of South China Sea, it has multiple islands. And these islands, one should know, they are your Spratly, Parcel and Scarborough Shoal. So they are extremely important. So a prelim pointer can very well come from these areas that, you know, Parcel Islands are located where. Now, this is a prop like a shape of a tongue. And so, China has created this artificial dotted 9 dash or 10 dash line. So, when we say 10 dash line, it has just been released in 2023. Earlier, it was the 9 dash line. So, through these series of dashes, it shows that this is a territory of China. And it becomes an issue. Why? Because we know, in accordance with UNCLOS, you have 200 200 nautical miles of exclusive economic zone. Now, any country which has this huge space, which, which shares this space, let's say Philippines. So, what they would like to do? They would like to explore this area for any resources. Let's say if there is fuel, if there is gas. 
But what China is doing? Again, unilateral approach. That immaterial of whichever country is there, I don't care. I will take up this. So behaving like a local dada. Now, <clears throat> the map has been clearly rejected. And before, before 2023, this matter directly went to unclosed tribunal. And this tribunal clearly laid out that there is absolutely no basis. No basis whatsoever in accordance with international laws to the nine dash line. And so it is completely illegal and against the freedom of navigation, which is the basic tenet of global commerce. It is the basic tenet of maritime laws. Now, let's look at what China has done. So China has gone for creation of these artificial islands by let's say using sand and by reclaiming land. So large scale reclamation of these islands and then creating military assets, let's say some airstrips and some patrol vehicles. Then creating a air defense identification zone. Now what do we mean by this? That simply means that if I want to, if I wish to travel over the South China Sea, then I would have to inform or I will have the chances of getting shot at. Right. Then militarization of the entire region. So this affects what? This affects the trade. And this trade will be more affected to any country which gives any statement, any contentious statement on China. Let's say if Philippines gives a very hard statement on China in Jakarta uh, during the East Asia summit. So what will happen next day? You will see that China will pick up some boats of fishermen or it will stop some supplies. And that has precisely happened. Then this region is going through overfishing and destructive fishing practices. And that's a ecological concern. And there are also exploration being taken up. Exploration for what? For resources. Then this will also lead to coral reef degradation. And we can see that these three group of islands. So there are multiple claimants to the same islands. So these are not single islands. They are group of islands. So China, Taiwan, Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia. They are all claiming their EEZ individually. And therefore, they will have claims over different islands out of the set of Spartley, Parcel and Scarborough Shoal. Now, post-2016, China has even intensified these operations. So, what is the response? The response is primarily coming from the US. And US is trying to hedge this region with the pivot to Asia approach. So, it... US is trying to act as a pivot. It is trying to hedge against the violent rise of China, against the territorial assertiveness of China in and around its territory and this unilateral tendency to grab more and more land. So it has been conducting these freedom of navigation operations. These are also called phonops. So this can again become a prelim pointer. That phonops has been in news with reference to, right? Then <clears throat> this has further intensified the rivalry between US and China. So let's say the US president meets in ASEAN and then holds a bilateral with let's say Vietnam. And then there will be let's say some action on Vietnamese boat. So what is this? Action and then retaliation or reaction. So that has been going on. And who is the biggest victim of this big power rivalry? It is the ASEAN countries. Now, what is the, what is the global outlook? So the globe, all across the world, majority of the countries, they will say that freedom of navigation should be ensured. Why? Because let's say there is a shipment moving from Mundra port to let's say South Korea. So, will it go through the South China Sea and can it be disrupted? And if it is disrupted, will the insurance cost of these ships, will it go high? 
will it increase and if these costs are increased will our exports be suffering naturally now why south china sea issue china is trying to create so according to some strategic theorist china is trying to do two things a it wants to create a hedge against a possible us pivot by going for projects like one belt one road or belt and road it is also going for creation of these ports which we'll refer to in the next discussion the string of pearls then it is also going on to fund a lot of smaller countries through debt trap diplomacies simultaneously it is going for these road based routes example best example is china pakistan economic corridor so that nobody can choke china at the malacca strait and so it wants to have alternatives for what for its trade for its exports for its energy imports so it also wants to save itself while also going for territorial dominance in and around china and to bully its neighbor so that they remain they are cut to their size now any efforts that has been taken place for peaceful resolution so one is the 2002 declaration on conduct of parties so this is right now this is not binding this is non binding but this was a mere declaration in the south china sea a non binding agreement between china and asean countries that have been taken place but beneath the surface there is simmering tension all across and whenever there are phonops phonops conducted by let's say us or let's say there is some malabar exercise or let's say there is any group based drills so then there will be continuous retaliation coming from china and this is a classic example that we can quote whenever we are discussing let's say indo china issue or whenever we are looking at the lac issue why because it shows a pattern of china bullying its neighbors and using this economic might to finally create a military might in the region and become the biggest challenger for the west and become the alternate to the us model now in the east asia summit and the asean summit in jakarta president xi did not go instead the chinese premier went and chinese premier says that he will go for deepening of ties with indonesia and how do they deepen their ties through the belt and road initiative on the other hand simultaneously italy seeks to opt out of the one belt one road or the belt and road initiative so this can be called bri alternatively it can be called one belt one road so this is a pet project of president xi which started back in 2013 now let's understand what is belt and road so let's say i am a country which behaves as a loan shark okay simultaneously i also go for trade distortion so let's say i am able to produce this pen for 10 rupees but at 10 rupees this pen is not competitive in the world market so now the indian government gives me let's say 5 rupees of subsidy so now what i can do i can sell this pen or export this pen at 5 rupees so this kind of trade distortionary practices are very common not only from the government of china but also from the provinces and even municipalities why because they want to promote exports and to get more dollars inside so over the period of time what will happen naturally you will demanufacture the world so demanufacturing and you will not have any regard for labor laws so scant regard for labor laws and you will make people work for 14 15 hours and based upon hourly wages which is also 
uh, which can also be called as an incentive to work harder. Then extreme, extreme form of authoritarianism on people through withdrawal of any democratic means of expression. So what will happen eventually? You will have trillions of dollars through this manufacturing led exports. Now, who were you? You are a person who believes in trade distortion and you are also a loan shark. So now this loan shark has 3000 billion dollars of let's say reserves. Let's say India has 700 billion dollars of reserves and let's say China has 3 to 4 thousand billion dollars of reserves. So now this loan shark what it will do? It will come out with various schemes. Schemes to use this 3000 billion dollars, 4000 billion dollars so that it can fund smaller countries or simply make fool out of them or just to earn money through high interest rates and small countries to control them and you will give money in exchange for strategic assets. So the Belt and Road Initiative is a unilateral measure of China. It is a unilateral measure. So China will determine how the world should develop. And we can see that it is engaging with countries which are poorer to it. So China would do what? It will tell Nepal that there can be three projects. One, a rail project, then a road project, then an electricity project. Then this electricity project will go to a Chinese company which will again give it to multiple Chinese people and which will create jobs back in China. So China, Chinese engineers, they will come and they will operate some, let's say, power plant or transmission line in Nepal. So what they are doing? They are creating jobs. They are earning also. Why? Because this large project, so Nepal has no money to, let's say, uh, go for a $3 billion project. So they will give loans. Loans, let's say, the World Bank is given at 1%. So they will give at 4%. So higher interest rates for better incomes. Now what, what happens if Nepal defaults? So China will say, I would like to have some assets near the India border. Why? To just keep a track of Indian troop movement. To just create some pressure on India. So likewise, what China is doing that it is going for unilateral infrastructure projects. And let's look at it. So outside, it's an investment program. Investment spanning from, let's say, rail, road, then electricity, oil and gas, port, then businesses. So I will first create a rail network, then I will create a business to run that rail network or to run an electricity project. So even profits after funding it and then finally through multiplicity of these projects, the idea is to, to challenge the US narrative and to challenge the US ideas of let's say foreign bases. So US has multiple bases, military bases all across the world. So China also wants to get an alternative foreign base, right? Let's say Djibouti, let's say Amban Tota. So it wants to create these foreign bases. It also is interested in these ports. Just now we gave the example of Amban Tota or Chittagong in Bangladesh. So these ports they want to control. Why? Because if this is India and these ports are all across, so can it can it put pressure on India in the seas, yes. And why India? Can it control the economy of Sri Lanka also? Right? Simultaneously, what do we see? We see that through the Belt and Road Initiative, there are two parts of Belt and Road. One is the maritime. The other is the road-based Silk Route. 
so maritime silk route and the road based silk route and why do china why is china investing this money because it got a lot of money so let's say 3 to 4 trillion dollars out of this i am investing 200 billion dollars to earn let's say 300 billion dollars and to destroy let's say 10 countries and to let's say take control effective control of 10 other countries so in all china is trying to increase its influence through its money right and with money once you default comes the military to take over those assets right now <clears throat> how it is projected how it is being sold so it is being sold as to promote connectivity across europe asia africa etc and any country which is facing some deficit in financing any small country which is facing any deficit in financing they would very much welcome let's say 30 billion dollar of projects right but there are these evil designs and the biggest evil design is the china pakistan economic corridor why because it directly snaps directly goes through passes through the through the pakistan occupied kashmir the region of gilgit gilgit baltistan and through the karakoram pass and therefore when india started making roads in durbuk so durbuk so dbo road which india created so what what led to this what happened after this so clashes clashes in the form of your galwan valley why because it wants to create these infrastructure on the border but wants to stop others so it's negative kind of leadership that you're trying to stop the other nations from developing and you want to also cripple these smaller nations in and around you now what are the key interests so the core interest is to pursue its core agenda in its nearby regions let's say nepal let's say pakistan let's say bangladesh let's say myanmar so promoting its core interest what is the core interest to keep on earning this money the money which it has made in last two decades and so pumping again a lot of goods and services through trade distortion so if i have taken 60 billion dollars from china can i stop china from dumping these goods into my country so if i am taking 5 dollar uh, 5 billion dollar of bailout from china i have to allow the chinese toys to enter my market i cannot argue and if let's say i am a politician and i am heading a cabinet and i have been paid bribes from the Chinese consulates, from the embassies, then what will, what will I do? I will never object. So this is happening to the smaller countries. Then to leverage geopolitical opportunities. And the biggest thing that China wants to do is an anti-West as well as a non-West fora. So India talks about inclusion. China wants to create its it has hegemonic designs so it wants to create its own grouping where it is able to aid abet and support a lot of let's say autocratic powers to finally achieve what a new regional order and a new world order right now <clears throat> the challenges of these evil designs so dead traps debt traps for countries debt traps for companies then checkbook diplomacy using checkbook using a big check to get a favorable policy outcome so let's say ask nepal to issue a stern warning towards india right to affect the friendship between india and nepal and get a hundred million dollar check checkbook diplomacy or maybe a two billion dollar loan plus project so checkbook diplomacy then going for puppet governments where where there is resource so the idea is to dump a lot of goods all across the maritime silk route road silk route then cripple these nations financially take control of the politicians 
and therefore these designs are failing why because they are now being completely exposed and classic example is the china pakistan economic corridor approximately 60 billion dollars and what has happened to the pakistani economy has it improved because of the 60 billion dollars or is it asking it is begging for as 1 billion dollar every week in front of every country it meets right so it has made a lot of countries uh, with a begging bowl, right? Then the string of pearls. And these string of pearls are not only an alternative to the US island strategy, but it is also to check emerging powers like India. And therefore, India has come up with its own counters and checks in form of Sagar, security on growth for all in the region. And going for these inclusive and sustainable methods of development and sharing these technologies with the world and to repose faith and in turn earn the goodwill of the world. In the G20 meeting, the African Union was supposed to get the membership and the Prime Minister has announced that G20 will include now African Union. And this is a classic success in terms of whenever we are talking about the Global South. Why? Because these 20 large economies, they were unfairly represented when it comes to Africa. And therefore, African Union comes in news and it can be a very important prelim pointer. So, the African Union has officially become a member of G20. And its relevance is all about the agenda of India and the success story in terms of looking at interest of Global South and the and the neglected part which is developing and emerging economies. Now let's look at African Union. So created in 2002 and it's an African continental body. So a single union for all the countries of Africa. Headquarters in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. Then it consists of 55 member states and it has replaced its predecessor called the Organization of African Unity, OAU, which was founded in 1963. So less than 20 years right to african union now what is the objective again for unity cooperation development among african nations and to treat this as a region for better integration so treating africa as a region why because we see if you look at the map of africa you will see that a lot of countries have ge geometric borders why because these borders were drawn unscientifically during the decolonization period, right, in Berlin. Now, what is the structure? So, uh, going back to the previous point, so these are the geometric maps and therefore what happens, let's say this is an area and I make a geometric map like this, right. Let's draw this with black. So, let's say I am creating these cakes of countries, bricks of countries. So what will happen? So let's say there is a cultural region. So this cultural region has been broken into multiple countries. Now what, what this has led to? A lot of conflicts. A lot of conflicts between ethnicities, between tribes, right? Between linguistic issues, creating linguistic issues and therefore the African countries, A, they are suffering from lack of development. They are looking at starvation, hunger, famines, while they are also aspiring to develop. So, this brings to focus that there must be some unity between the countries of Africa, like the example of European Union. And European Union is built on two fundamental principles, free movement of people and business or say trade. So, this helps to bring more solidarity and unity rather than conflict. Now, what is the structure? So, there is an assembly. So, the assembly is the highest decision making body consisting of head of states, let's say the prime ministers and the presidents. Then there is an executive council. These are made up of foreign affairs ministers and they basically go for the groundwork. Then there is a AU commission and they handle day-to-day -day matter. Then there is the P20 
पीस एंड सिक्योरिटी काउंसिल सो विल वी कैन सी दैट देर इज सम फॉर्म ऑफ मिमिक्री वेन यू रिलेट दिस विद यू एन स्ट्रक्चर सो अगेन अ पीस एंड सिक्योरिटी काउंसिल रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर मेंटेनिंग पीस एंड सिक्योरिटी ऑन दी कॉन्टिनेंट नाउ आर बी आई हैज डिसाइडेड टू डिसकंटिन्यू आई सी आर आर इन अ फेस्ड मैनर एंड दिस पर्टेन्स टू योर जी एस थ्री नाउ वॉट डू वी मीन बाई आई सी आर आर एंड देयर फोर वी मस्ट लुक एट वॉट इज सी आर आर कैश रिजर्व रेशियो सो लेट से आई एम अ बैंक एंड दिस बैंक हैज थाउजेंड क्रॉड्स सो टू मेक इट मोर सिक्योर the bank will have to deposit exactly 4.5 crore with the rbi and in turn the bank will earn no interest so interest free deposit it has to do why because these reserves can be contingency reserves which can prevent the run of banks or any financial exigencies now this crr what it will do so let's say i had 1000 crores and you ask for 4.5 crores so i am essentially tightening what liquidity and why do i tighten liquidity because let's say there is too much money with the bank so it will lend too much so can it create inflation yes so whenever there is excess liquidity the bank the bank is usually uh sorry the regulator will usually ask for absorption of this excess liquidity now <clears throat> what has happened that we went for 2000 rupee note they were withdrawn right so this created excess liquidity now crr is a fixed instrument right so it is let's say 4.5% right now okay but in times of exigencies an incremental cash reserve ratio was bought by the rbi why to absorb the excess liquidity that came to the bank because of the withdrawal of 2000 rupee notes so now let's look at what is icrr so it's a monetary policy and monetary policy comes from whom it comes from the reserve bank of india right so to manage liquidity liquidity of what liquidity of money in what in the banking system then it is a proportion of your net demand and time liabilities so let's say 1000 crores and 4.5% amounting to 4 crores then the banks maintain this amount with the rbi and this crr the cash reserve ratio is a fixed percentage but icrr is not having a fixed percentage and icrr can be adjusted by rbi to control excess liquidity in the banking system and it is a temporary measure and therefore now that all has happened so this extra cash will be gradually being released will be gradually released from the rbi towards the banks in a staggered manner not all of a sudden but in a staggered manner thank you so much i hope it helped